And so we are in <clears throat> the London Baptist Confession of Faith, 1689. We're in chapter 30, paragraph 4, and it reads like this. The denial of the cup to the people worshipping the elements, the lifting them up or carrying them about for adoration and reserving them for any pretend religious use are all contrary to the nature of the ordinance and the institution of Christ. <clears throat> now, on the first Sunday of every month, we have the Lord's Supper. If someone came up here, including myself, and said to you, you're only allowed to take the bread and not the wine. What would you think? Heretic, yeah. <laughs> Start there. <clears throat> That's very kind of you. Um, <clears throat> I, I would be extremely angry if I heard that. I would be extremely angry. Partly because you're withholding something from me that has been instituted by Christ himself. And unless I'm an unbeliever or I'm in unrepentant sin, I have full access to that remembrance or what symbolizes Christ's death for me. I'd be extremely frustrated and angry. I would even say I would get up and storm the pulpit in many ways. Now, if you know me, I'm, not, uh, <laughs> I'm laid back, but things like that would, would, would get me worked up. So, in saying that, I'm going to give you a couple of pointers to consider as why this is critical for us as Reformed Baptists. Now, the fear for the Roman Catholics was, and I was talking to someone after the 8.30 service, and he had, um, he had gone to a wedding, and part of the, the mass, because the guy was Catholic, is they, they, they put a plate underneath uh, when the, the priest was giving the, the wine, to put a plate underneath that sort of cup. Or, um, <clears throat> and the, the issue here is that uh, the why the, the wine was withheld was they were afraid of spilling the wine, right, and therefore Christ's blood. <clears throat> and so in their minds, in the Roman Catholic mind in this time, if, if, you, if you take the bread alone, it's as good as taking both the bread and the wine. So for the, the laity, if you were to take the bread, it's as good as you taking also the wine, even when you don't actually partake of the wine. And this is deeply problematic for us. And so the faithful fathers, the church fathers, recognize this, and pointed to the scriptures, obviously. And here we have Matthew 26, 26 to 28, where our Savior says, Now, as they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take it, eat it as my body. And he also took the cup, and when he had given thanks to, he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink of it. Now, in the same way, why do we have access or why do we have restrictions when we consider people saying, No, you can't take that or you can't take this? The second part of that LBC is carrying or the elements were lifted up or carrying them about as adoration. Exodus 20 is very clear on this. Nothing should be created as a graven image. So when you see the symbolism of the priest lifted up and everyone goes, wow, that is an act of idolatry. And that's contrary to the nature or the element of the actual ordinance itself. It, shouldn't, it should not result in any of those things ultimately because it's been instituted by Christ. I'm going to pray for Tom as he comes up from 2 Timothy, that we may be blessed and ready for the word. Father in heaven, we thank you for such ordinances, such as the Lord's Supper. We thank you that there is now no more restriction to access that is full and found in Christ Jesus our Savior. As your servant expounds the word, may we be ready to receive it, and the full blessings and benefits that come from you, our King and our Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Yes, it's important to make sure that we get the, the ordinances right. The way that the church functions matters, and that is the theme of 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy and the book of Titus, what is called the pastoral epistles or the pastoral letters from Paul. So can you please open up there, 1 Timothy. We're in chapter 1 again. If I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you yet, I'd love to uh, after church, and we're really glad you're here. I hope somebody's made you feel very welcome. If they didn't, I'm doing it at least. You're welcome, so don't complain about anybody not welcoming you. There you go. Uh, we're glad you're here. We hope to see you and uh, bless you. Uh, uh, we're in 1 Timothy, which is a, a series that we're going through about the, the right establishment of right order in the household of God. Now, that sounds really spiritual and amazing. Wow. Where's God's house? You're in it. Not the brick and mortar. 
But the gathered people of God, where they covenant to each other and join together and then serve Jesus in the world, what, the, what we call the local church, that is the household of God. In the Old Testament, we said last week, God sort of dwelt in that covenantal sense in a, in a tabernacle and a temple. In the New Covenant, God dwells among His people so that wherever they are gathering in any culture, nation, or land, there God is working in them and through them. The church was established by Jesus. It was purchased by His blood. It was uh, uh, built and ratified by the sending of the Holy Spirit who ever since Pentecost for the last 2,000 years and for the 20,000 that are to come or the next 20 days that are come, who knows, Jesus' Spirit will be building the church, the Spirit's temple of God in the world. And the church is called amazing things in the Bible. The church is called the Bride of Christ. I love so many things in this world. I value highly very rare books that I have on a special shelf in my office. And just slightly below that, my children and... Uh, no, I'm joking, I'm joking. I value many things. Don't, don't pretend you've never thought it. Uh, we value all sorts of things in life, don't we? But nothing, if you're a husband, a true husband, nothing is valued by you higher than your bride. And the Bible has the audacity by the words of God to say that the church, the people, us sinners, saved by His grace, are in fact the household of God, the bride of Christ, the temple of God's Spirit. Amazing word, the, the army of God. It uses all of these amazing words and pictures and explains it because the church is God's agent of change and agent of growth for the kingdom. But how, how, many, how many people just get real pumped up for the, by the Spirit? They went to a conference. They want to serve Jesus. They want to build the kingdom. I'm going to go join this parachurch organization. I'm going to join this lobbyist group. I'm going to do political change for Jesus. I'm going to, I'm going to join this, this charity. Are you at a church? No, I'm too busy serving Jesus. You're not serving Jesus. You love Jesus, maybe. You're distracted from serving Jesus by lesser things. There is no institution like the church. There is only one indestructible institution and organization in the world in all of history, and it's the church of Jesus Christ. You've got to join one. You have to believe in Christ by faith and be cleansed of sin and forgiven of sin and going to heaven. And then until he takes us there for your whole life, you join to a local church through whom God grows you and God uses you to grow the church, and then other people hear about Jesus. Other churches are started and planted until we're dead or everybody's Christian. That's the goal. Like, we don't run out. Don't ever, don't ever get frustrated. Like, what is there to do? There's plenty to do. You have at least one person in your family that's unsaved? That's your mission field. A street that, needs, that has letterboxes that you can put tracks into? There's your mission field. There is endless work to do until... Jesus comes back and it is the church, the local church under pastors and elders and with deacons and with membership and in structures. That is, where God, that is what God uses to bring about his kingdom change. Now, because the church is of such high value to God, like anything that is treasured or highly valuable in the world, it is therefore envied, it is attacked, it is sought to be stolen and utilized by an enemy. And the devil does this. The devil attacks the church. Jesus has assured us the gates of hell, all of Satan's uh, 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 forces will not stop the advance of the church to save all of God's elect people by the preaching of the gospel. It will happen. But the devil does send attacks. And sometimes it's, we see this all in the book of Acts. Sometimes it's literally demonic attacks. People getting attacked by demons. Sometimes it's political attacks where things just become hard for the church to function. Sometimes it's persecution where they're actually being targeted and killed. Sometimes it's their leaders like the apostles in the book of Acts getting killed and having their heads chopped off. Sometimes though, it's none of those things. It's an even more uh, dangerous aisle and, and, and method of attack. And this is false teachers. This is the infiltration of God's true church with false brothers. So when we say false teachers, what we mean is people who are actually unconverted, who present to everybody on the outside as a spiritual person, a religious person, a biblical person. And we shouldn't think that there's true Christians and then the fake hypocrites who are so, so easy to see. Sometimes they are so sneaky. They can be unconverted and they come into the church and they look good enough and they, have, they, they teach okay and they, they're presented well and maybe under a, under a good leader, they're fairly stable. But when the leader goes away or when this person just breaks out of the mold on their own, it turns out they're unconverted. They preach a false gospel or they, they twist and lead the church in, in bad ways or they abuse people at church. 
This is what we mean by false teachers. It is one of Satan's favorite ways to damage the church. I would say this, it was his first matter. It was his first method of ever infiltrating God's people. Even before the fall, Satan, the, the, the clothing that he put on to come into the Garden of Eden, yes, I know it says he was a snake, he put on the garb of a false pastor. He came to Adam and Eve, said, let's open up the Bibles to first and second opinions. I'm going to tell you about God's law. And the God's law, you know, it's so strict and it's so harsh. And if you really love autonomy and if you really think you're valuable and if you're really made in God's image, you should be able to do more. You take the tree, take the fruit. He won't kill you. God's a liar. That sounds like every liberal theologian pastor today. That sounds like, like 30% and I'm being gracious of evangelicalism today is, oh gee, look what this says. Well, it doesn't mean that. Let me tell you what I think like Satan, the first false pastor in the Garden of Eden. Satan loves to do this, and it is so effective. We, you know, we, we could think of you know, all over history. This example bears true. There's one great example in the CIA in the 1980s and 90s. There was an, an operative and, in fact, an infiltrator, a spy, who would spy on the Soviet Union for the sake of America, bring back secrets, uh, help organize infiltration operations, training operatives, sending them in behind the Iron Curtain to get details and to sabotage the Soviet Union with their Stalinism. And it was found out about 15 years later that one of the head men in organizing these, who just, it was just such a bad run of luck. Everybody he sent ended up getting killed. Everything that he planned, everything that they tried to do, and he wept and, and was so, uh, you know, he was working together with these brothers to try and uh, uh, infiltrate the Iron Curtain. They just couldn't do it. Turns out he was working for the Soviet Union. He was sending brothers to their death. He was telling the Russians what was happening over in America so that they could twist and infiltrate and sabotage. He was a double agent. And this is something that became more effective against America than any of the foot soldiers that they lost. You could lose 10,000 foot soldiers and lose less ground than one of the leaders being false and actually working for the enemy. And this is what a principle that Satan knows, and so he sends in false teachers. And as you look down to 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 3, we see the same principle working out in the very early church. Satan, it's been around. This is encouraging. It's a bit discouraging, but it's also encouraging. Satan has confronted and attacked the church this way in every generation. I said this to the, to the earlier service. Don't be one of those people that think a great church will be a smooth-running church and won't have attacks. And so when you get an email, please don't listen to this individual who is spreading hearsay, gossip, and heresy. And you go, oh, what sort of cult am I in? They're telling me about dangerous teachers. No. Or as we, we have to confront error and heresies from the pulpit. And as we shoot it down, or as maybe every now and then, every, uh, who knows, every couple of months, every six months, every couple of years, somebody spouts up and has to get literally knocked down. And Well, literally, if Keith's around, but figuratively knocked down out of pulpit, stepped aside, disciplined, rebuked publicly. This happens in 1 Timothy 5. Paul has to tell Timothy, it is so normative in the church that this is how you publicly rebuke elders who are becoming heretics. Like, it's, it's 101 church theology. Satan sends these, these arrows against the church with such normativity. It is so normal that it's, it's like the Persian arrows that they said will come against Leonidas and his 300. We will send so many arrows, it blocks out the sun. What does Plutarch tell us Leonidas' response was? Ah, then we shall fight in the shade. That's what it's like being a Christian. If you're actually on mission... He'll send all sorts of heresies, all sorts of false teachers. We'll fight in the shade. We don't care. Tonight, we dine in heaven, right? <clears throat> oh, no, you know that quote. All right, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. As I urged you, Timothy, he says, when I was going to Macedonia, you remain at Ephesus so that you may charge. That's a strong word, charge. Charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine not to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Certain persons, by swerving from these, have wandered away into vain discussion, desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding either what they are saying or the things about which they make such confident assertions. 
May God bless the reading of his own inerrant and powerful word in our midst this morning. Paul had sent Timothy to hand down authoritative charges to establish purity in the church because false teachers had raised up among them and they were in the eldership. The way you read 1 Timothy, you realize they were doing the teaching. It says in this passage, they were trying to be teachers of the law, but they had no clue what they were saying. They were ignorant and spouting idiocies. And Paul says, the teachers need to be, it's a bad day in church when the elders need confronting. But this is what was happening, and, and, and it's, it, this is, we said before, just the normal attack of, of Satan against the church, and as long as people get in this 21st century nicety, egalitarian sort of view of life and church and peace-loving and everything, and as long as you think confronting elders is like last-ditch effort, I mean, if somebody's a pastor, then, then maybe once every hundred years they have to be fired, like if that's your mindset for the church then you are rife for the devil to come in and give you a a, a, a hypocritical, heretical, false teaching pastor and you'll just assume the best. And it's dangerous. It's very dangerous. The fact is this, this is the paradigm to go by. Every church needs to be active in pushing down and pushing away false teachers. Like if, if every person that applies to be a pastor gets a job as a pastor, that's a bad church. It's a very small hole that you need to be able to uh, navigate in order to uh, uh, thread the needle. It's not just that everybody comes through. Anybody can attend, except for certain uh, uh, dangerous people. And most Christians can apply for membership and be accepted. Few people could be deacons. Some can be ministry leaders. Very few can be elders. And so if you're not used to, if you're in a church where, where, where the, 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 the discipline and the teaching and the, uh, the, all these things... And, and the warfare is not happening in eldership. That's because the false teachers infiltrated before your time and they currently run the joint. It's either a church that is actively pushing back against false teaching and disciplining those who false teach, or it is a church run by the false teachers. That's just how it is. So when I get like the email or the message or I'm sitting across from a pastor and he kind of boasts like, I don't know what you're doing wrong. I don't have to deal with these issues in my church. My answer is, I think you're the guy that should have been dealt with. I think you snuck around, nobody said no to you, now you're running the show. Why would you put up a fight? Why would the devil put up a fight? Why would he send you any problems when you're the problem and you're running the place? Goodness me, how far we have drifted from Paul's injunction to Timothy that his authoritative command needs to be to charge these men to shut their mouths. Paul, if we can set ourselves a bit of a timeline In about uh, the 50s, the early 50s, Paul had gone to Ephesus in modern-day Turkey, basically, and he he just started preaching, and he had about two and a half years in this city. Mega city, metropolis, cosmopolitan place, just one of the biggest cities in the Roman Empire. And he, he set up shop there, preached to the synagogues, preached to the marketplaces, evangelized, did debates, hired out a community hall for five hours a day, constantly evangelized, right? Gets to a town, there's no church. Oh, I'm going to create a church by evangelism. That's how it works. Preached, preached, preached. People got saved en masse. All of the Satanists and the uh, uh, black magic worshippers, people who did sorceries and spells, and all the Harry Potter fans, we, we just call, you know, the state schoolers, they, uh, are <laughs> just kidding, How, come on, a bit of relaxation, we're having fun. The, the, the dark arts had this enormous following in Ephesus, and it crumbled. It crumbled because they were, they were giving away millions of dollars of their books to be burned. They were repenting. They came to church. The other side of the, of the spectrum was the religious uh, uh, Artemis worshippers. And their purchases of silver idols funded, basically it undergirded the economy of the city. So by the time a riot started against Paul, the claim was he's turning our whole city upside down. He's changing the culture so much because because he's starting a recession because no one's investing in the Central Reserve Bank of Ephesus called the Temple of Artemis anymore. The whole city was being changed. Why? Because he went in and, and established some laws? He ran for politics and changed some of the legislation? No. Because Jesus was declared as king, people were converted and came nigh unto him for salvation and their lives changed. Their money, their worship, their spending, their time, everything changed and Ephesus changed. 
So he had one of the most thriving churches in the New Testament. And as Paul leaves, he ducks back to Miletus. This is in Acts chapter 20, you can read. Paul goes back and has, a, has an emergency meeting with the Ephesian elders. He says, I'm going. I need you to know something the Spirit's told me. And in his, as an apostle, he hands down this prophecy. He says in verse 28 of chapter 20, he says, elders, this is an elders meeting. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all of the flock. That is a heavy charge to every elder. Yourself and all the flock. You will vouch that your own sanctification is a pretty rocky road sometimes. Imagine sitting at the front of that car, driving that, and you've got a convoy of 200 you also have to look out for. The the flock of God is entrusted, in a subsidiary sense, to the elders of God, elders of the local church, to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. That's a precious church. You don't stuff this up as an elder. I know, he says in verse 21, I know that after my departure, right, big alpha male pastor leaves, then the false teachers stand up because they're all cowards. They never sit down with him. They're never one-on-one with him. Do you know how often I get, pause, do you know how often I get, I get asked by somebody, hey, has this person spoken to you? They've got weird views. My usual response is, look at me, look at them. Do they seem like the sort of person that would sit down with me one-on-one and run their heresies by? No, I don't think so. No, they never do. They, they're like rats and cockroaches. They're in the dark. They're in the swamps. They're underneath the carpet. That's where they stay. So Paul's saying, I'm going, and they're all going to come out. Look what he says. They will come in among you. After my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves. He's talking to the elders. He's saying to the elders, some of you, I don't know which one, but some of you are going to become false teachers, dying wolves, fierce wolves, killing the flock. They will rise up speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert. That's what Paul commanded them. Were they alert? Maybe, we don't know. But at least those who were false, those who were in power, they were able to some measure take control of the church of Ephesus. And five years, five years is not a long time. It does not take long. But five years later, Paul has to send Timothy back and then write him letters to tell him, you need to set things straight because the church of God is at risk here, which he purchased by his blood. So Paul sends him back. And this is, what, this is what he is sent to deal with. Look at verse uh, 3. He says that he is to remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons. He also uses that phrase certain persons in verse 6. And in our day, that the, the equivalent of that would be some guy. Tell some guy, that dude, like it's intentionally uh, B-grade derogatory. He's not calling him a name. He's just like not even giving him a name. You know, like you meet somebody that you don't like, and you're like, hey, Greg, oh, it's, it's Tim, whatever. Dude, guy. Tell the guy to stop preaching his stupid theology. No, oh, he's a pastor. We, we call him Dr. Reverend Pastor, you know, the guy. So just certain person, some dude. Uh, that's, that's the language of Paul. He's just der- deriding him because sarcasm, derogatory speech is always appropriate against those who are abusing God's bride. Some people get annoyed that you're not nicer to the people driving God's family off of a bridge. They stop yelling so loud. Why are you so mean to him? Because he's drunk at the wheel and it's God's children in the car. Oh, gee, I think he means well, though. No. So we're all happy with mocking them together. That's, our, that's part of our job. Good. <clears throat> Five years later, he sends him back. He says there's certain persons are teaching, teaching heterodoxy is the language that comes. Hetero means different. Doxy is like doctrine, heterodoxy, different doctrine or different teaching. Has charged them not to teach it, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. This, this responsibility is we're getting ourselves again in the mindset of healthy church, a church that grows because people's adding, God, Jesus is adding people to our number and saving them. And a church that is growing healthy because the growth doesn't become fat and the growth doesn't become disproportionate. And it's not like those gym guys who get such huge shoulders and chest that they give themselves a back injury. 
need to make sure that as the church grows, she grows in proportion and in healthy ways and in right manners. And so as we're thinking about the local church, we need to recognize that this injunction given is primarily given to Timothy. And it is carried on especially by the elders of local churches. So, so I'm saying defense of the local church against false teachers and false pastors, that responsibility falls primarily to the elders of a local congregation. You can't punt it off to a denomination and say, can the headquarters please reassess this man? You can't punt it to some, uh, uh, some other group. Can you guys make sure you're only sending us the best of men? You don't get to uh, 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 send it out to the people, right, elders, and say, oh, they'll know that the people with democracy, egalitarianism, it's the 21st century. What? Well, I read my Old Testament. What would the mass of people ever choose wrong? No, the congregation is actually unfit. I'm saying this honestly to you as somebody who used to not be a pastor, You are not fit to be the primary assessors and discipliners of false teachers. Not because everybody's an idiot. It's not that. It's that it's just not God's ordained way. Because in the congregation, there's people who are not even saved yet. There are people who are very recently saved, baptized last month, and now they're being asked, you need to decide what maturity, theology, Gospel and responsibility, it looks like in a pastor. And they go, I'm still learning about Trinity. The congregation also has people who are backslidden and in sin, but but being helped, but in no way fit to be deciding who should be the leader on their own calls. The congregation is also of those who are fairly ignorant. And it also has people who are strong, who are active, who are mature and who know much. But the eldership does not have that mixed nature. The eldership should be those who are, who are well-trained, who know their theology, who have doctrine, who have conviction, and who have guts. That's why he gives qualifications in chapter 3 of what elders should be so that they can be the right kind of guys to stand defense. So, so let me say this. Absolutely, it is every single Christian's job to defend, false, to, to defend true doctrine and to contradict false doctrine but not so much as it is to the degree that the pastors are then excused from their primary responsibility. It is primarily their responsibility. Paul says to to Titus in chapter 1, when he's telling Titus what sort of men to make elders, he says he has to be able to hold the, 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 the word as taught so that he can give instruction in sound doctrine and also be able to rebuke those who contradict it. He has to be able to not just pass the tests, not just have a degree from a seminary. He has to be good at confrontation and not shrink back. That's a ministry standard. It's not good enough for pastors to be great at leading meetings and good wedding and funeral MCs and a good committee leader and an administrator. And he can mow your lawns as well. He needs to be able to have some fight in him. He needs to be able to confront people, not out of emotion, but out of conviction. And ask really clear questions. So, so future pastors, people who feel a sense of a call, is that you? Can you just have straightforward, confrontational uh, uh, questions and answers and conversations where you tell people what is true, base it on the word of God, not your emotions and not what maybe your wife is telling you? You, what you see in the word of God, can you confront on that? Very few can. Very few can. The language that Timothy... that. First and second Timothy and Titus uses all that, so Paul uses it all over, is fight, 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 fight. Fight the good warfare, not the bad warfare. Fight for the kingdom. You're a soldier, he says. You're a boxer, he says. You're a farmer, he says. Real, hard, gritty kind of jobs. He uses the language of warfare, of fighting, of weapons, of killing, of slaying, of an enemy. And some ministers say, well, I don't like the fighting, then you'll lose. Well, I don't like the language of fighting in the New Testament. Then you'll lose, and you're a loser. You have to come to the Bible and take it exactly as God says it, because it's his word. You can't edit God and then be expected to be patted on the back as a really gentle, nice, winsome pastor. You're a liar. Get out of the pulpit. So this doesn't mean that we, we take swings at every person who, who, who doesn't know every iota of theology. Uh, this means that when a fight is necessary because somebody is twisting, somebody is diverting the church, somebody is distracting the church from her mission, elders need to be able to stand in the way, speak clearly, speak straightforwardly, and thus defend the church of Jesus Christ. 
<clears throat> we can look at what teaching they were particularly uh, speaking. So look at uh, uh, the, uh, end of verse 3 and into verse 4. Timothy's job is to, you know, we obviously always say in the, in the, in the New Testament, the, the church is the body of Christ. And Paul has sent Timothy over to get rid of some of the parts of the body. I've read it this way in a, in a church leadership book this week. One of the most important parts of the body is the colon. Right? Because it allows to get rid of all of the garbage that if it stays in your body will poison you. Maybe some of you need to just quickly Google what is a colon. Uh, uh, the rear end allows poison to be gone. That's an important part of the body. Do you know that there are many, 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 many churches that don't have a colon? So everything just backs up and blocks other things. They start to stench and rot. It gets into the blood. People are sick. Did you know that many churches are like that? If you don't have church discipline, if you don't have uh, rules for, for people, rules for tighter rules for elders, if, if people never leave, if any old dog can come in, start spouting heresy, and he's, he's just sort of pat on the back and left in the corner, that's a body without a colon, and it's filling up the body. It's not good. Timothy needed to go in there and basically give the church a diuretic. Make sure the things that needed to go could leave so that it could grow in health. Look at what they were teaching. Different doctrine, end of verse 3. They devoted themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculation rather than the stewardship from God. Heterodoxy means different doctrine. It's not the same situation as, say, Galatia where it was a different gospel. It doesn't seem at this point, that it's, I mean, Paul would be so clear if he was writing to Timothy in this Ephesian, if there was a false gospel, they were denying Jesus' resurrection like in Corinth. They were denying Jesus' penal substitutionary atonement like in Galatia. They were denying sola fide like in Galatia. He would be clear, but, but he's not clear on those things. He assumes those things because, because the church hasn't deviated from them. It's just blowing out of proportion, these teachers, they're just blowing out of proportion other elements of doctrine, making them more important than the gospel, focusing on them every Sunday, and then going into weird genealogies, weird myths, and weird opinions. So the language here is uh, myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculation. Now, in the Jewish tradition, this has this is sort of popped up that all of these allegorical, spiritual interpretationists who can look at the genealogy of Moses, genealogy of, of Abraham, and say, here's what all of these numbers mean. He grew to be 590 years old. Ah, numerology. You carry the five, you multiply the nine, it's 666. <laughs> right? They, they move all these things around, they, and then they can speculate and say, I heard one person say that... The eight angels that they believed were sent at one point represent the 12 tribes of Israel. Eight, 12. It didn't work for me. I don't know if that makes sense for you. you know, so, so they have these books in the old ancient uh, Jewish literature, which was just speculations. They just made stuff up, assuming the Spirit was telling them. And, 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 and then it would come sort of down to you, like, well, so are you a part of this genealogy? Are you a part of this ethnic? Are you a part of this tribe? Because this promise still is alive for you. Or the Babylonian uh, cursing is actually still in play. And they just keep going. And the thing about this is, it's uncheckable. It's unstoppable. Paul calls it endless. You can just go on every single day about what next lunar eclipse and solar eclipse means. And what genealogy uh, uh, means. Are the Nephilim still alive today? Take this online quiz to find out. All of this stuff. It's, it's all endless. It's useless. It's, it's ancient genealogies. It's ancient law. You know, he even talks about the, trying to be teachers of the law. So they're probably Jewish. They're trying to be teachers of the law but have no clue what they're even talking about. And um, in some ways, you could look at what they were teaching, and this is the true today as well. Sometimes somebody is a false and dangerous teacher, not because they're saying things that are necessarily wrong, but because they're blowing out of proportion things that are true, but very minor. You go in and every week they're teaching on genealogies. It would not be right to come in and say, hey, genealogies aren't inspired by the word of God. Uh, genealogies don't matter. They don't belong in the Bible. Stop teaching it. You're a heretic. It's not right. It would be like coming in and saying, 
you're blowing this one body part way out of proportion. You're unhealthy, you're distracting, and you will kill the church in a more roundabout way. There's this old, uh, well, not old, I'm sure it exists, and it does often in the third world and in tropical areas. There's this condition called elephantitis, so aptly named, but named by, like, obviously a grandfather, just not PC. They named it because you look like an elephant when you get it. Very, you know, today they give it something in Latin. Back then, it, elephantitis, that's what you called. That's your diagnosis. And what it was, it's the blocking of certain lymph nodes that cause the swelling of certain body parts, like the nose, so that it literally looks like you have an elephant's trunk. Just keeps on growing. Or arms that are just like the size of another human being. Or legs that look like elephant uh, feet. Or eye eyebrows that just grow and hang over like a, like a cloak or a blanket over the whole body's front, person's front of their body. And, and the whole body is dragged. Now, you couldn't come to that person and say, you shouldn't have an eyebrow. You shouldn't have a right arm. I'm like gaslighting, you know, every healthy body has a right arm. I just have more right arm than you. I'm probably more healthy. No, no, proportion matters. So you can come into some churches and ask the pastors, and they'll tell you the right gospel. Yeah, I'm so glad you know the gospel. Why haven't you preached that for five years? Why is it always about how to be a good friend? Why is it always about how Jesus wants me to budget? Why is it always about how to be winsome? Why is it always a, a pandering to the leftist ideology and gay agenda? Why is it always that? Why, why is it always little things expanded? Why is it always soft things made the front? Why is it always, always wrong things given too much questionable space? Why not preach the gospel? And the reason is, though they may not be technical heretics, they may well be unconverted. They don't really value the gospel much. Preach it every week. Gee, people are going to get pretty bored with that. Like, how many angles can you look at Jesus dying? It happened once. He rose again. We're all good on that. Everybody knows Jesus died, rose again. All right, let's move on. More exciting stuff. Because they don't love the gospel. They're not born again to love the gospel. They don't have a pure heart. They don't even have a sincere faith. They definitely don't have a good conscience. This is why they keep on going back to the law and requiring it of the church and, and making sure they're following it and adding all of these silly things because Jesus died for our sins on the cross to make us right with God and rose again and reigns in heaven and is establishing the church is boring to them. And if it's boring to you, you're not in the kingdom. And if it's irrelevant to you, you're not born again. And if it's, it's so strange and, 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 and old-fashioned to you, you're not saved. And the call of God is for you to have what Paul talks about next. A pure heart, a good conscience, a sincere faith which brings forth love. So he focuses on love. Look at what he says. Uh, uh, he says, they're, doing, they're teaching ridiculous things. They're saying things about the law that they don't even know what they're saying. The charge, look at verse 5. The aim of our charge is love. Love. That issues from a pure heart, good conscience, and a sincere faith. Love, really? Confronting the pastors is loving, if you love the church. Confronting the false teachers is loving, according to Paul, and according to Jesus. Jesus did a lot of confronting preaching, do you recall that? It wasn't all hugs. It wasn't all, all hold hands in kumbayas around the fire. It wasn't all just camping trips with the disciples, sharing their feelings and writing down their dreams and putting it into a fire and praying for each other. It wasn't that. In fact, it wasn't that at all. It was a lot of hard line ministry where they confronted false teaching and then died for it. That was Jesus. That was the apostles. That was what Paul was saying to Timothy. Do this like I did. Do the stuff that a riot started against me for. Preach against the idolatry. Preach and teach explicitly against the heresies, not just of the world, but of the church. And charge these men that they're not allowed to preach anymore. Kick them out. They have to sit down. They're not preachers or teachers anymore. This is a charge from Paul the Apostle through Timothy himself. Look at what else he says. It, it's loving to do this. The, the aim of our charge is love. It's going to lead to more love. Which issues... From a pure heart and good conscience and sincere faith. See, love is the fulfillment of the law. These, these guys want to teach the law. Paul's going to teach the thing which fulfills the law, which is love. They want to focus on weird law things so that they can get clean. Paul tells us how, how to have a genuine good conscience, and that's by trusting in Jesus. 
They want to, to, uh, to, to establish rules and regulations and, 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 and do things by their obedience to impress God and establish the church. Paul says, I'm teaching you what comes from a sincere faith. Trust in him who fulfilled the law. Trust in him who tells us what to do. Trust in him who died for you. Trust it. This is love that issues from a clean conscience of sin, a pure heart, and a sincere faith in Jesus Christ. This is true ministry. Hard fights, confrontations, and contradictions, rebuking men who want to take the church by storm, but doing it because we love them. Doing it even even more than we love them, because they've already made themselves an enemy. I love the church, and I love the people. That, that's my primary, primary motivation. Paul commands order. This is a, this is a very interesting little um, uh, uh, relationship that we see here in verse five and, uh, uh, five and six, uh, 4, 5, and 6. So Paul says that the genealogies, the useless teaching, all of that stuff, it produces something. Every, every theology produces something. Bad theology produces bad practice. Good theology produces good practice. What's the bad practice that the sin, the horrible sin that's destroying the church, what is it? You might look at, oh, what's destroying Ephesus? It's probably, it's probably uh, homosexuality and, and fornication and murder and, and thieving. You know, you know what the sin that Paul is infuriated at and so sends Timothy to deal with is? Nothing. That's the sin. A church doing a whole lot of nothing. Just existing, thinking about the early days when revival hit and we established a church. But now we've moved, you know, we all have arguments about the law and we sit down and we talk about controversies and what's happening in Big Eva and, and which pastor has a scandal going on and, and which angels might be looking after us and what part of the law code should apply to our civil society today. And, all, and they just sit and they're obsessed and they're talking and doing nothing. And it is what if Ephesus ends up getting closed down for by Jesus. By the end of the New Testament, Jesus writes a letter in the book of Revelation. It says, return to your first love or I will snuff out your light. Church doesn't exist anymore. Timothy, Paul says, look at the end of verse, uh, verse 4. Endless genealogies which promote speculations. And then verse 6 says, they wander away into vain discussion. Speculations, vain discussion is said over on this side. They're just talking about what they think, silly, controversial, but unproductive nothingness. On the other side, Paul says, rather than stewardship, which is from God by faith. That language of stewardship means orderly household management. That, that, that's the language. A, a household manager is a steward. The father went away, he set me in control of all of his affairs, his monies, and his children. If the master comes back, if the father comes back and finds all of his children eating Cheetos out of the corners, climbing in the roof and swinging off the ceiling fans, lighting things on fire, and you as the steward are sitting on your video game, conquering the world through pixels, Surrounded by Pepsi cans and Cheetos and Uber Eats orders. He'll come to you and say, you have not done what I commanded you to do. I wanted you to establish order so that the household could work productively. And he would say, I've conquered three kingdoms. I beat the Romans and the Visigoths. I'm now building a Byzantine castle right now. Look at my gameplay data. And the father would punch his head through the TV. That's what he would do. Because while trying to, while do, being very busy, he has produced nothing so that the household has got into disarray and lack of productivity. That's the dangerous thing that's happening to Ephesus. Paul's saying the stu you need to realize that good theology, good teaching, makes an active, productive, effective, good fruit bearing church so that souls get saved, people grow, churches get planted, missionaries go, missionaries come, missionaries go again, more churches get planted, and people keep on getting saved until Jesus comes back. That's the plan for the church. Productivity as opposed to vain teachings and speculations. Teaching of the Bible creates productive people. 
teaching of controversies and speculations creates idleness and a waste of time. I praise God daily for this church. I I walked into church the other week, uh, actually last week, first week of the two services. Come through 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 the car park, I see a bunch of people setting up orderly chairs, tables, things so that people can sit and enjoy some fellowship. Before I get through the door, I'm welcome. There's people setting up welcoming station. Before I get through the door that far, I see down in the kitchen, there's people setting up food so that people can enjoy their company and be hospital- uh, give hospitality to visitors. Uh, before I even make it up the stairs to my office, I see in here there's people practicing for worship. There's people setting up the chairs in an orderly fashion. There's people up on the camera team doing their things. I see somebody sitting down and talking to an unbeliever. I could hear them preaching Christ to them. I walk up the stairs. There's a prayer meeting happening down that hall. There's people getting ready to teach kids about Jesus in that room. And I go into my office and I start praying and looking over over the sermon notes. I think this is a church with a lot of moving parts. Point one, praise God for productivity and may he give more lest we fall into idleness. Secondly, if you are not doing anything, it is not for lack of opportunities. There is any number of evangelism teams, prayer groups, Bible studies, places to serve, chairs to put out, food to serve or cook, things to do to help, and in so doing, contribute to the productivity of God's household as we seek to seek and save that loss. There is plenty to do. There is plenty to do. And the church of God is where you're being called. Come and and live in a good conscience. Come and live by a sincere faith and a pure heart and serve Jesus so that we don't just know things, don't just affirm things, don't just recite truth in the Bible, but put it into action so that others like us get saved and added to the church. And if you don't believe in Jesus, to whom, for you, I bet the whole discussion about a good church versus a bad church, this whole language would probably be lost on you a bit. I'm not saying it's beyond you, but maybe outside of your realm of interest. It's because you're not in the church. If this was your family, you would really care. You're not in the family, and so it sounds somewhat irrelevant. And I want to say to you, God's word to you today is not become a good church member, give more to the church, do more for the church, attend church more, or pray more, dress better when you come to church. No. God's word to you today is that you are a sinner lost in your evil and wickedness. And I think if you're at all honest, you can, you can amen that in your heart and say, I am a, I'm a wicked person. I, I do sin daily. I fall short of even my own personal goals and moral standards. I know I'm wicked. God says his law is infinite and you have fallen infinitely short of it. And so an infinite payment in hell is waiting. To you, he says, in love he sent his son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for your sin. I don't know who you are or what you've done. I know that your sin is savable by God, is forgivable by God because Jesus died and his death is more powerful than your sin. It pays for it completely. You can have a good conscience before God. You can have it cleansed because Jesus has paid for you. And then, and then after being saved, after putting your faith in him who died for you, God will add you to this, to maybe this or another, a church that will love you and encourage you and help you. And all that happens is is for your good until you die. And it's a glorious and marvelous thing that God makes us members of his family to be busy. But first, have you trusted in Jesus Christ? Have you said, I can't do it, I can't earn myself heaven, and I will not try. I need a savior. Your savior is in Jesus Christ, and I compel you to believe in him. Let's pray. Father God, Paul's Paul's command to Timothy still rings clearly through our ears this morning that Timothy and pastors after him have to establish order and encourage people in the faith and teach the Bible so that the household is orderly and the household is moving and the household is productive. We pray, Lord God, that we can be a, a church like that that sees many people hear about Jesus, many people meet Jesus, many people be trained to serve Jesus, and many churches planted for Jesus through the operations of this church by your grace, by your spirit, and by the power of Jesus Christ. We ask that, Lord God. We ask also that the ugly necessity of that is that, is that false teachers have to be confronted And I ask, as Paul warned the elders, Lord God, that you would warn each of us inwardly. What what ridiculous and irrelevant heresy am I holding on to? What what silly and pointless and irreverent doctrine am I toying with? What what useless and unproductive ideas do do I love to throw myself in? Lord, please guard us against those things. 
so that we would hold fast to the word as it has been taught and that we would, we would be far away from false doctrine. We pray, Lord God, that anybody who does not know Jesus themselves, that you would give them faith in his name, that you would save them from their sin and add them to our number, Lord God, that we might, might grow with them, might love them and, and see them live a life glorifying to you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. And everybody said...